Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best minds in the sport so you can train smarter, stay healthy, and run faster now. And now your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. One of my favorite quotes is by Neil Donald Walsh, Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. Even though this quote is quite well known, we often tell ourselves that we are great at taking those leaps of faith. I often wonder, are we really? One person who has embraced this to the fullest is my guest today. She is one of the figureheads of women's running, and a photo of her in the Boston Marathon was voted one of the 100 photos that changed the world. Pretty impressive. Not only did she change it that day in Boston in 1967, but she has kept that momentum going and is still encouraging it. She's breaking down those barriers, pushing those boundaries further and further away, and making sure the women of the future have as much opportunity as men. My guest today is Catherine Switzer. Catherine was inducted into the USA National Women's Hall of Fame. She was the first class of inductees into the National Distance Running Hall of Fame, the first woman to officially enter the Boston Marathon, and she has a personal best of 251.33 in the marathon in 1975. She also won the New York City Marathon in 1974. She is an Emmy Award-winning TV commentator and an author of the book Marathon Woman, which I will put a link to in the show notes. After Catherine shares her monumental story behind those iconic photos from her Boston Marathon race, we are going to talk about why running leads to empowerment and when that empowerment is combined with education, it can lead to freedom for women all over the world. Why the grassroots movement by women taking on running themselves was what changed the world, not the induction of the women's marathon into the Olympics why running can be seen as a common language between us all, and how we are essentially all part of one big community brought together by running, and how social movements occur, and what you can do to contribute to this movement. So that's enough intro. Let's meet Catherine. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Catherine. Thank you very much. Great to be here. We're very excited to have you, one of the most influential women in the sport of running in the world. So I'm very, very excited to have you here right now. Um, So let's start with that famous day. Could you tell us, uh, for the listeners that may not know about it, we do have some international uh, listeners who may not be American. I'm sure most American have heard of it. But if you could you tell us just a little bit of a background on what happened? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's a it's amazing how. Um, history records you. <laughs> and in this case, um, it was April 19th, 1967. And I had trained for the Boston Marathon with my coach at Syracuse University. And he was very encouraging to me. We had done the distance and practice. In fact, we had done 31 miles, which is about 50 kilometers to our foreign listeners. Mm-hmm. And um, I was very, very confident about doing the, the distance. Um, a woman had run the Boston Marathon the year before I had by jumping out of the bushes and, and covering the distance. Um, so I knew I wasn't doing anything I thought exceptional. Um, and I had, but I had entered the race and I'd entered it by signing the entry form with my initials because that's how I signed my name. And my coach, um, had insisted that I register for the race because he said Boston was serious. It was a serious competition and you didn't just jump out of the bushes and run. And I said, okay. And we had to get travel permits and pay entry fee. I had to get a medical certificate. I did all of this, you know, paperwork. He helped because he did the travel permits. Um, and another guy from our cross country team, um, was going to, to run. And also my boyfriend, who was a nationally ranked hammer thrower. Well, this was, <laughs> this was a point of some contention, but anyway, he was going to come and run with us. And he had entered the race, but he hadn't taken the physical. He had to take the physical when he got to the start line and picked up the bib numbers. Anyway, um, what happened then on April 19th is that, you know, we had arrived in, in Boston in the, in Newtown, Newton, in fact, the, the night before, taken a motel. And the next morning it was snowing and sleeting. And we had on our big baggy gray sweatsuits because it was so cold and freezing. Everybody did because it was utterly miserable. It was, um, 
It was about 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's, uh, what, three degrees Celsius, two degrees Celsius. Yeah. yeah and um, a, a headwind and snow and sleet. So it was really, really ugly weather. And during at the start line area, at, at the packet pickup, my coach picked up the bib numbers for my friend and me and says, stay in the car. There's no point in you guys standing out in the cold. And I'll go in and get the bibs because they're all together as a team packet. And my boyfriend, anyway, had to have his physical. So um, he came back out to the car with our bibs, and we pinned them on. And, um, you know, we did our warm-up, and, and all the guys in the area were saying, hey, it's great that there's a girl running and that you're official, and we're really with you all the way. And, you know, that's great, and I wish my wife would run. I wish my girlfriend would run. <laughs> and um, I was feeling really happy and buoyed because I had always been – really welcomed by guys who ran. It was only the general public who thought it was very strange in those days for a girl to run. And um, when my boyfriend came out, he had taken his physical and he was angry because they thought he had high blood pressure because he was all hyped up. But he passed it anyway. And now we were kind of late getting to the start area and I was in, you know, getting kind of agitated. And well, anyway, we got into the start line and the officials were really frantic because the snow and bad weather had delayed everything and they had to start this race bang on at noon. It always started at noon. Um, so they shoved us in the starting area and checked off our numbers. And, and when they shoved me into the starting area, um, also I said, well, obviously there's no problem because, you know, I look like a girl. I had on lipstick and, yeah. and they just yeah. pushed me in. So the gun went off down the street. We went and I was, you know how you feel at the start of a marathon. You feel so excited and so happy. You're finally there. You've done the training. And the first two miles are you feeling great. You know, you know that pain's going to come later, but for a while at the front, it's just, you're like a band of happy Indians. Uh, <laughs> and all I really wanted to do was finish the race. And this was, this was my, my dream come true because my coach in practice, um, told me once that he didn't think any woman could run a marathon. And I got really angry with him. <laughs> and he said um, he didn't believe that a woman had run it the year before. And he said a woman's simply not capable of it. But every day in practice, he was telling me how good I could be. And every day in practice, he was telling me about another marathon he had run. He had run Boston 15 times. So when I said that I wanted to run it, he didn't believe it. And he said that he would take me to Boston if I showed him a practice that I could do it because he never believed a woman could do it. So when I ran the 31 miles, he was really impressed. So being at Boston was not to prove anything. It was, it was a reward um, from my coach. And um, we were there in celebration of this wonderful, wonderful event. So about two miles into the race, though, the press truck came by us. If you can imagine in those days, it started behind the field. And pushed its way through. And I was beeping its horn and pushing us over. So we moved over. And then when the truck got in front of us, the, the press corps went crazy. The photographers seeing a girl in the race wearing numbers. And they were taking pictures. And and, um, and we were smiling and waving. And, you know, hi, mom. You know, it's kind of one of those. <laughs> and, but alongside of the, the press bus was a official's truck. A, sorry, official's bus with... Um, journalists also on it and the race directors including this guy jock semple who was the co-race director and he was getting teased by the journalists about a girl is in your race jocko you know she's wearing numbers and jock lost his temper he was he had a short fuse anyway he was a really very angry guy jumped off the bus ran down the street and attacked me just grabbed me and Spin, spun me back. I didn't see him coming because the, the bus was behind us. And I heard him at the last moment and turned and he just grabbed me. And he screamed at me, get the hell out of my race and give me those numbers. And I was really, really terrified. Um, yeah. Yeah. I really jumped to get away from him. And by jumping and getting away from him, he missed the bib number on my front. Um, and, and then he tried for the one on the back. It caught the corner of it. But he caught my, he caught my sweatshirt. And um, and pulled me back and was really clawing at the, the numbers to try to get them off. And my coach was yelling at him, leave her alone. She's okay. I've trained her. Leave her alone. And he said, you stay out of this. And he was and the press corps were now on their feet screaming and yelling too, taking pictures. And then my boyfriend, as I said, who who was um, a an, an nationally, nationally ranked hammer thrower, 
who, <laughs> who weighed 235 pounds. I have no idea what that is in kilos and stones, but it was big. Um, and he threw a cross body block uh, into the official. And he sent him out of the race instead. I mean, he sent him flying, actually. And um, my coach said, run like hell. <laughs> and down the street we went. We were all absolutely blindsided by this. And it happened, of course, in front of the press truck, which was very, very bad timing for Jock Semple, but um, in hindsight, incredibly good timing for me and the ensuing women's movement. Yeah. yeah. Because what, the pictures that were generated from this incident were outrageous. And one series of pictures in particular taken by this very famous photographer, Harry Trask, you know, he got boom, boom, boom. He, he, he cranked off three incredibly sequential photos that have gone around the world a million times now. Um, and have be, they've become one of the most galvanizing photos really in the women's rights movement. And anyway, but just, just to sum up the, the experience obviously, um, was, was quite traumatizing for me. I was really scared and I didn't know what in the world, you know, was wrong. And it was my first real brush with uh, that kind of discrimination. Um, and it was just uh, so out of the blue and, and it was very, very radicalizing to me. It was a sort of pivotal moment in my life. Mm -hmm. Up to that mm -hmm. point, people thought my running was maybe a little strange or weird or exceptional for a woman. But that, that attitude never came from male runners themselves. Um, and certainly not the few female runners I knew. And the, it was, the incident was very, very polarizing. Anyway, as I say, um, what happened then real quickly is, um, I still had 24 miles to run. It was still horrific weather. He had pulled off one of my gloves, which was quite devastating because when your hands are cold, you're cold all over. And um, by the time, though, that I got to Heartbreak Hill, uh, you know, I'd gotten over the anger because you can't run 24 miles and stay angry. You know, <laughs> you yeah. can. It goes. And I realized he was just a product of his time. He was a man of his time um, and that other women would be there if they only had the opportunities and encouragement that I had had. So I had decided no matter what, I was going to finish this race, even on my hands and knees if I had to. But I was going to, after I finished the race, really devote at least a part of my life to trying to get other women into running, to create opportunities for them. And I also wanted to become a better athlete. I didn't know if I could, but I knew that we were going to finish slowly because now the important thing became to finish, not, yeah. not yeah. to run well necessarily. Um, but to finish, I finished in four hours and 20 minutes. And, um, but I was, my life was changed. And, and, and the, the, the plan sort of was spread out before me. Create opportunities for women in the sport and become a better athlete. Yeah, definitely. Do you think um, if you hadn't, if you hadn't have done that or if you hadn't have had that experience, do you think you would have still had that same desire, aggression, like towards your goal to accomplish it? Or do you think... Had that not happened, it wouldn't have meant quite as much to you. Did that kind of flick a switch in you that you were going to do it no matter what? Or do you think you would have felt that anyway? I would have definitely felt that anyway. Even if, you know, if I'd been ignored, um, I, would have, I would have finished the race um, and I would have been empowered to do something for other women. Because my sense of running was that it was absolutely magic. The dis mm -hmm. distance running was a transformational experience for me. It was empowered me. It gave me a sense of self-esteem. It gave me a sense of destiny. And that's what now millions and millions of women are feeling. M women who have no aspirations, like you, Tina, who, who are an elite runner, um, not interested necessarily in competing or, or even getting that much better, but just going out and running every day and having this transformational experience happen to them. Because yeah. it gives yeah. them a sense of empowerment they've never had before. And I wanted to pass that on to all of them. And I knew the only way I could do that was to create the opportunities for them. So that effectively created a career for me when I began writing business proposals to organize women's running events. But yeah, I, so I would have been empowered, I think, to do that anyway. The sense I had from what I did, though, was a sense of responsibility 
and um, also that I had to prove a lot of people wrong. After I did this, and the pictures were out everywhere, suddenly there were people who thought I was Joan of Arc and other people who thought I was a pariah. I got a lot of nasty mail saying, you know, what was I trying to prove? What was, you know, women have no place out there. You shouldn't have done that. You should be cooking dinner for your husband. You know, that kind of stuff. When um, And so I felt the burden of responsibility to prove what I did was not a prank, was not some kind of stunt. Yeah. And, um, and I felt responsible for showing that I could become a better athlete. I, I think the incident really inspired me to become a better athlete. And I flogged myself. I flogged myself for 10 years and improved my time to 251, yeah. which in yeah. 1975 was damned good. And I felt if I can do that, millions of women can do that if they only have the encouragement and the opportunity. So again, my, my drive then began to create the opportunity. Oh, yeah. And I mean, like you mentioned, those pictures of you have gone round and round and you have kind of become uh, almost the figurehead for uh, women's running and, as a as a movement. And it, it is great to see. And uh, do you ever think, now you look back on it, could you ever imagine at that, uh, imagine at that moment uh, in 1967 that running for women would be where it is now? Or was do you think it was just kind of could you not see that far into the future? Would you think you'd be as big of a pivotal role as you have been? I didn't. Uh, I wasn't sure what if I would be a pivotal role, but I knew I was going to de- devote a lot of my life to it because running had changed my life. Um, but yeah, um, I can't remember if it was after Boston or soon after because there were an awful lot of interviews. Um, somebody said, "What are you trying to prove?" And I was angry at answering that question by that time, and I said. I'm going to prove that what I'm doing is not exceptional and that one day women's running is going to be as popular and publicizable as men's. But would I have seen what I'm seeing now? I don't think I believed it would happen as quickly as it happened. Um, That, and I'd never believed really that there would be more women runners than men. Uh, Mm -hmm. In the United States right now, the 58% of all the runners uh, participants are women. And I think this is true in Canada, and I see this movement happening elsewhere, um, which is amazing. I mean, it's, that, that means it's a social revolution. But I always thought it would be an empowering, um, uh, empowering social movement because I could just see the changes it was making in people. So um, I, I, I do believe I have the ability to be a visionary, but you have to also realize I'm a pathological optimist. And, um, mm-hmm. and, and, uh, I can actually believe and convince, uh, myself and people that things can happen that, that otherwise seem impossible. And, and they do, uh, often w- women's running has just been so wonderful and fantastic. And, and now, you know, that, that sense of optimism and that sense of really joyful can do and the ability to do hard work really is something that never, um, has left me. I mean, right now I'm looking at, at the next step in this revolution, w- which may be even bigger than the last one, which is happening right now. And that's going to be global because yeah. um, running is cheap. It's a for- and it's convenient. It's time, uh, uh, um, t- time valuable, I guess is the word I'm looking for. I mean, it, 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 it Time efficient. That's the word I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. It's so time efficient that and and the poorest of poor women can do it. And we are taking it, you know, to countries and places where it's going to bridge so many cultural and religious divides. A little scary to think of that, but it was scary forty years ago to think of what we were to. Yeah, let's move on to that then. Uh, first, you started with the Avon International Running Circuit, which was where you kind of began um you know promoting these events and kind of get women's uh movements going but you've recently been developing the uh 261 fearless movement um leading to the 261 women's marathon so how did how did all that kind of come together in your mind well you know what i gotta tell you something it didn't come together in my mind it happened organically okay and it's yes because it's not something i would have and i always preface it i wouldn't have expected doing this at my age, which is 68. 
I would have expected the next stage of the movement to be taken on by the next generation of visionary, powerful women um, who are empowered and have had their lives changed either professionally as athletes um, or, or, or women like you or who were involved in, in social movements. And suddenly it just began happening by itself. And I am gathering around me women who I think will take this, not, not think, I know, will take this <laughs> forward. Um, and, um, but I'm, I'm in the, we're in the, pl- the planning stages now. In fact, it's interesting that this conversation is happening with you um, only two days after I've just come back from an intense immersion summit with um, my team of four to outline how it's going to happen. And basically this is what's going to happen is, is that um, this movement is very, very powerful globally and it empowers women, women's empowerment and women's education is the thing that's changing the world right now. And it's very, very difficult and also in some places quite dangerous to, to go in with this idea. But as I say, running can be done anywhere um, or even alone or even virtually, you know, in your heart. And that's where freedom actually begins. So the next stage is, is with, with Avon um, in the um, late 70s and early 80s, I took together a business proposal to them and showed them how they could create women's running events around the world, empower women, and get the women's marathon into the Olympic Games. That was our goal. I thought if we got with a women's marathon into the Olympic Games, people would aspire to that. Women like you who would become elite athletes and have this um, wonderful top competitive experience. Then that happened, okay? We wound up organizing uh, 400 races in 27 countries for over a million women and got, the wow. women's, yeah, and got the women's marathon into the Olympic Games in 1984. I thought that was going to be the thing that changed the world. No, the thing that actually changed the world was the grassroots movement of women taking on running themselves in a women-to-women way. Women see other women out running, or they say, come and join us, we're just going to have a jog, then we're going to have a coffee, and they reach out and, and, and they empower and tell each other. And you don't have to be good, you don't have to be fast, you can do this. So we have now a multi-level approach. We have women like you who are Olympic aspirants, and then women like my next-door neighbor who is slightly overweight but wouldn't miss her running date with her friends at 6 o'clock every Saturday morning, okay? And that has changed her life completely. So let's now we're going to take this abroad. How are we going to do this? Am I going to go out and write another business proposal? Um, I was, you know, I was lucky to have Avon love my ideas and hire me, and we had a very, very sizable budget. So that was fantastic. Now we have no budget. We have no business backing at all. Will we get some? Well, maybe. The important thing is is to start a nonprofit, a foundation, um, and we will get the team in, in place to start clubs, start an ambassador program, start um, uh, a, a outreach movement, a, a, a train the trainer program. We got all these things lined up and ready to go, and they have in fact started in some areas. And yes, does it culminate with a ma- the marathon, the two six one women's marathon in Mallorca? It can. But not all women can get to Mallorca. Eventually, probably there will be a series of 261 events, maybe low key, maybe big and flashy. Who knows? The important thing is the movement. And um, the important thing is, is that it is getting started. And as I say, it happened by itself about three or four years ago. People began writing to me saying that my old bib number from the Boston Marathon that the official tried to pull off of me is important to them. That is, makes them feel fearless. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, isn't that interesting that that old number, I hadn't paid any attention to that number. You know, it's just a number, 261. Oh, then people came up with all kinds of symbolism for it, that it adds up to nine, like Title Nine, or that Mm -hmm. nine is some kind of mystical number. You know, I'm not into crystals, magnets, and numerology. Honestly, I'm, I'm real meat and potatoes. Go out and do the hard work. It happens. So this was coming over the transom. And we've decided now to harness it and, and um, to, to, to help direct it and to help get support behind it. Because if we can reach out to women in particular, men too for that matter, but women who are, are fearful with us, ourselves, our knowledge, women who are relatively fearless, when you look at the rest of the world, um, we can do a lot to positively change their lives. And the vehicle of running is a very powerful vehicle. 
Yeah, definitely. And I'm I'm glad you did mention about the uh, you know the whole community and how it kind of organically grew itself. I did I did notice that myself. And like you've mentioned, you know, I I am an elite runner, but I do notice that it, most of the inspiration and other people joining in the running comes from seeing you know everyday friends or like the social aspect, which is great because it doesn't. I try to on my personal blog talk about how it doesn't have to be. Uh, you don't have to be running, you know, what I'm doing. You don't have to run 80, 90 miles a week and run a 240 marathon. You can, you know, you can be out there. It doesn't That's the wonderful thing about running, uh, which I'll actually go on to in a minute. Uh, my next question for you, the wonderful thing about running is, you know, everyone goes through those same things. Everyone goes through the same struggles. Everyone has the same doubts. Every Everything, we're all kind of doing the same thing. So it's it's great to hear you kind of say that and how you you took that and you kind of expanded it out to the other countries um that kind of needed it more than anything and is that how how did you kind of choose the countries um how did you decide which countries you were going to go for um to try and grow it out there you mean with 261 or yeah with, with 261 like malaysia and how did how did you choose well, I didn't choose Malaysia. A girlfriend of mine in Malaysia decided she was going to do um, a Malaysian women's marathon. And what did oh, I think? Right. I said, that's fantastic. And she invited me to come to the race, and I did. And we talked about 261. So now we have a sister relationship. How did it happen, Mallorca? An old friend of mine, a guy, um, r- realized that there was no women's marathon in Europe anymore. The last one was the one I organized with Avon in Paris in 1984. And... He said the women are running like crazy in Europe, but they're not stepping up to the big the big challenge. And what can we do? We thought we would put on a women's marathon. I said, that's great. And then he said, we thought we would name it the 261 marathon. I almost fainted, you know? Mm-hmm. That's what I mean by things sort of happening uh, quickly and organically. So, of course, you know, I threw my weight in it and, 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 and I've been helping make this race happen. And it's a beaut race. Got to tell you, fantastic. First, um, the first edition was last year in, um, in, uh, in March. It was, uh, we had 27 countries. This year we had, I think, 27 again. Um, and that's in Mallorca. So these people have been coming from all, all over the world. And next year it's going to be on April the 10th. So, a good date and a beautiful place. Yeah, I will definitely uh, put a link up there for uh, our listeners to check out, which you can find at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC59. And I'm also going to put, uh, Catherine sent me quite a powerful uh, video based on uh, one of the marathons uh, with the 261 fearless movement. And you, you definitely should check that out because it's, it's really powerful and that was great to see. And it kind of brings me on to my next question, which is... Um, you know the running community is a big focus for your for your this movement here um and in this video that you sent you talked about being able to talk in the same language without using the same words which i found absolutely fascinating um and you know how it, running is our is our language running is the way we are communicating and you know you see all these women of different cultures and different countries kind of coming together at the end of a race celebrating but what is it about running that you think is just so powerful and so universal? Well, it is a common language and it is something that changes all of us. And what happened, for instance, in, in Mallorca in particular, is these women have come together without any common language. So somebody saying, pointing to themselves and saying, Mexico, Mexico, and somebody else says, hey, I'm from Detroit. <laughs> says, I'm from Ireland, you know, and it, you know, whatever. But they know what running does to them and that they sort of hug each other and jump up and down. But what is it about running? What is it about covering the distance? Is it, is it the sense of, um, the spirituality? Is it the sense of, of being of the community? Whether we're together or whether you're running alone, you still know you have that community or whether it is just this bond where you feel really special and smug when you're next to somebody who she's in a burqa, you're in shorts, somebody else is, you know, in in a bikini top or something Mm -hmm. from all these different places. And you know, you're feeling the same thing. You know, you're feeling tired, that the sense of covering the distance is meaningful for you. Um, And that we all have complicated lives. We all have fear in our lives. We all have time constraints tough time at home sometimes with the kids or the hub or the dog 
um, that it's a sacrifice to get out sometimes and do this. And we do it anyway because it's so important to us. All of those things are unspoken and yet everybody knows them. And it's not something you know about the person who's next to you in an office because you don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. But you know in running that to be out there and the elements that um, you have shared a lot that's very similar. So there is um, the, the, the friendship, but more importantly, I would say the community of, of women. And that's what really the 261 Women's Running Movement is about. 261 Fearless is about that community. Yeah. yeah, and would you say the uh, the growth of you know social media and sharing has kind of aided in this because you know a lot of women, well, and runners in general, men and women, uh, when they finish a run, you know, they share it online, say, and I'm proud of myself, I did this, you know, kind of keeps helps you stay responsible and keep on track with what you're doing. Do you think social media had an impact in that? Kind of helped speed it along. I would say like 200%. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So much so that with the 261 um, movement that we're doing, one of the biggest things we've been discussing um, in our summit meeting was we've got to get a really, really great website up about it. You know, we do have a Facebook, you know, 261 Fearless Facebook. We have, um, you know, a, a microsite that's that's launching just in a couple of days, in fact. Um, we have not reached out for the ambassadors, but yeah, the, the website is going to be one of the most powerful tools we have because they're going to be women, um, in really isolated places, um, Saudi, North Africa, and some parts of the Middle East, other places, you know, we, we really want to reach them. And I think that's going to be pivotal. You know, people say, how can running do that? Well, if it's changed so many millions of lives in industrialized nation, you, nations, then you look at like what's happening to the African women who are running. It is really astonishing because those women were amazingly third-class citizens, really tough, you know, carrying water on their heads, you know, n- not being, uh, not really having any hope. And suddenly, you know, those who ran were beginning to earn money and coming back and transforming their villages. And then they're becoming socially esteemed. And they're becoming role models for women all over Africa. And those early women runners, you know, the Catherine de Rebas, the the Tegla Larupes, the Lorna Kiplagats, they're doing very, very powerful things now. And when they get into politics, it's going to be astonishing. So those are how things happen. You know, it's just, it's just that first step of self-esteem. No matter where you get it, it's just that running is so easy and cheap. You know, it's, yeah. quite, it's quite phenomenal. Yeah, and uh, one thing I want to kind of, you just reminded me of when you were talking about that was um, I actually, when I was uh, the London Olympics uh, in 2012, I was uh, watching athletics or track um, while the, I think it was the 800 was on, one of the distances had a, a woman from Saudi Arabia. And I remember she was, you know, uh, clothed head, head to toe and, you know, she was she was a long way off the rest of the, you know, <laughs> the professionals who have done it time and time again. But it was such a powerful moment being there, watching her come down that straightaway. Everyone was clapping, everyone was cheering. It like sent chills down my spine because I, I knew just how much that meant for her to be running there and not just that but the response she would have got and how you know I'm sure the rush of emotions that she had finishing that race would have you know inspired her and all the people that she would have told about it and watched saw her do it see well you know if she's doing it then I can do it so I it was that was a, a great moment for me to see and yeah I think you're right that it is it is kind of growing and you're going to keep seeing these role models come through and it, it's exciting to think that you know, the, the world's best runners could could be out there but not even running yet because they don't, you know, they haven't even tried. But, you know, people like her and, you know, you especially leading this movement to encouraging people to try and all these people, the women runners who are out now, you know, inspiring people, who knows what's going to come out of it in the next five, ten years. It's very exciting. Yes, it's really interesting that you brought her up. I thought she was absolutely pivotal mm-hmm. to the success of of, um, of this movement. And um, I've met her actually, and I don't I don't think quite she quite understands how important what <laughs> was. Um, and it and it is very, very, very courageous of her. Yeah. 
um, because, you know, I don't know if there's a fatwa out against her, but she doesn't seem to be too nervous about it. And um, I, I did, after the Olympics, read a lot of the feedback from Saudi journalists. And I got to tell you, I haven't seen such hateful stuff in a, really in all my life. Wow. Um, you know, if, if that were my daughter, I'd set her on fire, that kind of stuff. And um, so we have, we have a big, big leap to overcome mm-hmm. in a lot of places. Um, but I was just talking to my husband, interestingly enough, this morning about this. We, but, you know, 50 years ago, there was a big leap here, too, in, in, in the United States. And a, a lot of things that get legislated also help. For instance, the passage of the Title IX Amendment really, really was a sea change in the United States. It was changed not only the educational system, but the sports system, which is fantastic. Um, in the case of the women, woman in, from Saudi who ran in the 2012 Olympics, well, Saudi was not going to be able to participate in the Olympics if they didn't have at least one woman on their team. And that came down from the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, who legislated that. And, I, you know, I'm so proud of the IOC. I mean, they usually move at a very glacial pace. But, <laughs> but they finally had some teeth on that. And um, that's, that's how change often happens. Somebody important is going to have to make a decision. And they did. I was really, really thrilled with that. So, yeah, is it exciting or what? Yeah, well, and especially if you think about it, you know, you had all that negativity and you said you got a lot of hate letters and, uh, you know, look where look where you managed to take things, you know, getting the uh, women's marathon put in the Olympics in 1984 and, you know, getting Boston to be, you know, very accepting of women. So if you think about it that way, it's kind of good to see because even though she was the the person who had to take the brunt of it and it's almost good you said she doesn't really, you know, understand quite how you know serious it is in some ways that's probably good because it means you know she's going to empower it she's going to start that ball rolling but without actually uh having to deal with all the negativity of it as much as well hopefully hopefully she doesn't have to deal with it as much so that brings me on to the next question I was actually going to ask you which I've been thinking about a lot um so if if women's equality in in sport in running is is a mountain how far do you think we have pushed the boulder up the hill. How far do you think we have to go compared to how far we've pushed it so far? Well, you know, it's a strange question. (laughs) No, it's a wonderful question, the way you do it, because in a way, it's like marathon training. You know, you get to a certain point where you've done your first marathon and you think, wow, look what I've done. And then you realize how good all these people are who are an hour in front of you. Okay, and you realize how far you have yet to go. Okay, so then you run, let's say, a time like I did, like a 251, which is faster than I ever, ever could have imagined that that I could go. But even I knew that was nothing. I knew that women should be very soon, within two years of me, um, of when I did mine, going under uh, two hours and 30 minutes. People thought I was crazy. And then and then they, they did that. Okay, but with the social movement is the same thing. Once you get to a certain point with the social movement, then there's always a little bit of regression, you know, like the the, the rock rolls back a little bit and smashes your toes, okay? Um, but it, it hopefully doesn't smash you. Uh, and, then, and then you push ahead, but all of a sudden you're pushing it around a corner and you realize, oh my God, look how far we've got to go. I thought getting the Women's Marathon in the Olympic Games was going to take care of everything. I thought that then women everywhere in the world would want to run. and And, and it's only... You know, lately that you realize that that we have social and cultural problems around the world that are just it is beyond imagination in, you know, 2015 that we're still fighting a religious war worse than we ever have. Um, and and that the cultural restrictions on women are just as bad as that they have have been for the last thousand years in many ways in many countries. And overcoming this is not going to be easy. So when you say we've pushed this this uh, rock up the hill, um I don't know, <laughs> you know, reaching total equality, reaching total opportunity for women in the world. Wow. I don't know. Um, I guess I, I would say we're, we're two thirds the way up that mountain with that. Okay. 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 That's good. But 
but that's also the toughest part left to go then. <laughs> but you know this... what? It's like Everest. You know, they say it took me eight hours to do the last hundred yards. Yeah. You hear the climbers say that? I say eight hours? <laughs> oh, a hundred meters? You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> well, hopefully it's not quite that long. Um, but, <laughs> so then what can we do with this move- movement? How can all our uh, readers listening particularly women but then also the men what what can what can we do to kind of help help grow and help empower other women i guess it's the biggest thing is is to to believe and they do that they all all of them listening and reading are believing and understanding that running has changed their lives in a very fundamental way and that if it has changed their lives in a fundamental and good way, and they are changing their generation, their own kids, their neighbors' kids, I would say there are two or three really big things. One is to pass the word along. Just tell everybody you know, yes, this is important, and yes, you can do it. Yes, you can join us, okay? Encourage people, especially the most important thing, I think, is to encourage a kid, boy or girl, any age, your own, your neighbors, your grandchildren, you know, whatever. Just a little add a boy, add a girl goes a long way. Kids, I got talent is everywhere. I got to tell you, talent is absolutely everywhere. It only needs the encouragement and the opportunity. Because kids especially don't believe in the, in the power of their own capability. And it isn't until you take that first step, even as a runner, do you understand, wow, I did that. Then you take the next you do a 5K, you do a 10K, then you do a half marathon, you do a marathon. Pretty soon you're running across the Sahara, you know? It's it's amazing what we can do. So pass the word along. In terms of this, the women's movement and 261, um, you know, join us. You know, come along, be an ambassador, talk the, talk it up, create a club, get your group of people together, um, pass it on, um, and reach out. And when we get this website launched, reach out to somebody who's fearful and show them how to be fearless. Yeah, yeah great, great advice there. And what about, do you have any thoughts on people, um, you know, we all, we all know someone who just says, oh, I hate running, I don't, I don't like it. Do you have any, any? I, I mean, I'm always trying, and actually uh, my friends watching me at London uh, and my, some of my family members have become a bit more excited about it and actually have started running because they, they did feel inspired watching it. But have, do you have any any tips or advice for someone who, you know, they want to get the people around them interested, but they just don't seem to have any desire whatsoever to even try it? Sure. <laughs> uh, first of all, you know, the bottom line is running is not necessarily for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Let's just, let's just face that. But, you know, it's really amazing for me at 68 to be meeting women who are 70, 75 years old, who are only starting to run and absolutely loving it and saying to me, I used to hate this as a girl. I used to hate this in my, you know, because everybody, everybody was pushing me. I always got a side cramp. I just say, Hey, come out and join us. Walk, jog, shuffle, whatever you want to do. Um, and if they say, I hate it, I say, you're going too fast. Mm-hmm. In general, they're, they're all trying to go too fast. I mean, it's just every, they say, well, I like walking. I say, okay, great. Just get out and get doing that. And, and then just shuffle to the lamppost and then walk again. And pretty soon they're, they're running. And then after six weeks, they get that wonderful, uh, fabulous addiction because they get the endorphins, they get the sense of air and accomplishment. Um, but usually when people say, I hate it, it's because they're going too fast and it's a painful experience. Yeah, well, and I, I do think it's important to mention that, you know, even if that running is never going to be fun every single step of the way, but it is about embracing those down moments and those those moments where you do struggle make it feel even better when you do cross that finish line. So, you know, I guess that's another another thing. But, yeah, great advice there. So, uh, Catherine, yeah, I have just one other question for you, which is one I give uh, to all my guests, um, which would be if you could, well, I think I can probably guess what yours is going to be. If you could give one word to describe what you would like to become, accomplish, achieve in 2015, what would it be and why? Oh, yeah. Well, probably I've told everybody that already. <laughs> by, by the, by in 2015... I'm going to have the 261 Fearless Foundation established. We're going to be launching more training programs, more clubs, um, and encouraging women globally to tune in with us and connect with us, to use running as the vehicle to change their lives in the most positive way, 
imagined. Yeah, great. <laughs> and so if, if people do want to keep in touch with you, you've mentioned the website, would that be the best way for them to follow you? Or do you have, you know, a, a Twitter or a Facebook that they would, uh, what would be the best way people can kind of keep in touch with what you're doing? Facebook 261 Fearless. Um, and on that, that time in Facebook, in the next few days, really, we're going to be launching our microsite. And then after that, a fully blossomed website. And on those things, they will, they will see sort of applications for joining us and becoming an ambassador, being a part of the movement. It's all happening very, very quickly. So I would say the best thing right now is 261 Fearless on Facebook. Okay, great. I will definitely put a link to that on the show notes. And is there anything else you would like to add uh, to any of our listeners out there or anything you'd like to suggest? I'd just like to say to everybody, you know, when you run, you may think you're alone on a cold, rainy night, but you're not. You've got a million friends around the world who are feeling the same way you are, sharing your dreams and your despairs and your aspirations. Um, and to let running give you everything, because it will. That's great. That's great. What a great way to finish. So, uh, Catherine, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure our listeners are going to absolutely love this. And, you know, you're such an inspiration. You're, you're that image of you is, is all over the world. And you really have made such a huge difference in our, in our world. So thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you, Tina. And thank you for what you're doing for this wonderful activity. Uh-huh. Thank you very much. Wow. Empowerment is what she strives for empowerment is what she gives. (laughs) Isn't she amazing? I wish there were more of her in this world. But actually, you know what? There can be. We can be those people. We can encourage growth and help that social movement gain momentum. So we can hopefully push that boulder I talked about further up the hill. What Catherine and I talked about today, in addition to links to all the races she talked about, can be found at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc59. If you are interested in any of the races she puts on, check out the show notes for more information. I have to admit, I'm very tempted too. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I would really appreciate it if you could leave us a review on iTunes. On the show notes, there is a video demonstration of how to do just that. I promise it will only take a minute or two and it will really help us rise up the rankings to becoming the number one running podcast. It won't take long. Thanks so much in advance and have a great week of running.